All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope everyone's staying safe um, and uh, looking forward to uh, possibly trying to get back to work, kind of reopening things as safely as possible. Um, hope everyone has done their best to uh, be productive during this time. And um, we're going to spend a little time talking about kind of one of the more fascinating uh, productivity tools on the market today. Um, obviously, this uh, COVID-19 situation has uh, been an extremely successful um, uh, byproduct for, uh, for Microsoft and Office 365 and some of their collaboration suite. But we do really want to talk about uh, why uh, we believe that there are some places that uh, you can improve on the data protection security of that data, especially as more adoption is uh, is starting to happen. And so my name is William Bell, Executive Vice President of Products. And joining me today is Michael Deemer, Inside Systems Engineer at Veeam. Thanks for joining me, Michael. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, William. Thanks for having me. All right. So we're going to go ahead and kick this off here. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of poll questions just to size up the audience a little bit, try to understand where everybody's coming from. It'll help me frame uh, my conversation today. Uh, we've got some really exciting stuff. Uh, and uh, you're even going to get a live demo that Michael's going to do for you so you can see some of this in action. So I'm going to launch this first poll. Uh, talk about industry verticals. Where is everybody coming from? Um, you know, what's your day-to-day -day business look like? This will help me talk to a, speci a few specific examples if I can. So everybody get that vote in. I'm going to wait until we get about 30 to 50% of votes here. Hopefully everybody can see it. All right, we're getting some jumps up. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna close that poll out. Um, I'll share some of those uh, results with you guys. 57% uh, from the business e-commerce area, 36% from financial uh, and healthcare, and then 7% from education and gaming. No SaaS, which is kind of odd. Um, we tend to get a lot of folks that come from the SaaS area, but uh, we'll take that. And then the second one real quick here, uh, company size. Uh, what does it look like for you guys? Uh, size of organization. Um, and then that will uh, allow me to frame a, a few different things that we're going to talk about and what it, what might make sense for your organization. Aha, perfect. Everybody's on top of it this time. <laughs> Lots of quick votes this time. So, um, you know, as expected, 88% uh, from less than 500 employees. Uh, it's pretty typical. Um, Phoenix App and Veeam have a strength in the SMB and mid-market space. Um, and so I, uh, I do believe that that's uh, typical for us. Uh, don't worry, guys, over 1,000. We're going to talk a little bit about some enterprise use cases as well. Um, we're both working with lots of enterprise customers every single day. Uh, and we try to, um, you know, kind of meet different needs um, as, we, uh, as we talk about various uh, different protection ideas and mechanisms uh, around Office 365. So, why why are we here, right? I mean, I think a, the biggest question mark, maybe some of you guys have, is, you know, why do I need anything to help me, right? Uh, Microsoft has it under control. They've got my data. It's backed up. It's, it's uh, redundant. Um, and, and the answer is kind of. Um, it is safe in a redundant fashion from... Uh, some type of uh, data outage on Microsoft side. They have replicated the data, but um, what isn't always safe is um, the uh, accessing of the data and the data uh, from uh, accidental deletion, malicious employee, you name it, right? Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways that uh, the data cannot be, that can, can be uh, unsafe, but also uh, can be, um, uh, deem non-compliant for those of you that are for those of you that are in regulated industries i think that's important to understand as well and microsoft talks about it specifically in their service agreement right it's like hey look how did just happen uh you know you may not be able to get to your data uh sorry um the even if you look at uh the way that they describe um their shared responsibility model around office 365 there are direct statements that talk about your ownership of your data 
and how it is your responsibility to ensure its safety. And I think that that's a, a very important hallmark to remember as you're looking at any type of cloud service, not just Office 365, but any type of SaaS service, any type of cloud service. It's very important that you understand what that shared responsibility model looks like so that you can take action for your organization uh, and really try to get uh, um, a, a level of safety and protection that makes sense for your business. So, you know, how do we get here? And I think that the, the biggest uh, components are kind of listed here. Um, we are seeing a lot of SaaS hacking, right? We're seeing a lot of folks, uh, you know, that have been, whether it's a box, Dropbox, Office 365, you name it, right? There's, uh, it, sometimes it's as easy as just stealing a username and password and you're in, right? Whereas in other previous environments, it may have taken some type of corporate level access, some type of VPN, uh, access with two-factor authentication, hopefully, you know, um, a lot of uh, folks as they move to SaaS environments and Office 365 specifically, um, fail to implement adequate security controls uh, after or during migration of the data and moving to this new type of service. Um, there is this kind of unspoken belief that just everything's taken care of and I don't have to worry about anything. Um, and it, and it, it couldn't be further from the truth to some extent, right? Um, you know, I think that the things that you combated, uh, on-prem with exchange and SharePoint and, and, and the like, uh, they still exist in the cloud. They haven't really gone anywhere other than you don't have to provision the infrastructure or keep the software uh, running. Right. Um, I think that's the big benefit, right? Is that, you know, our organization, we just moved to Office 365 from being an on-prem exchange kind of COTS uh, environment on the on-prem exchange for 12, 13 years, right? Um, you know, I think that we're at a, at a point where it makes sense to take some of these things, even for an infrastructure company like, like ourselves, and move them into these types of services because, you know, frankly, we don't want to keep the, a bunch of exchange administrators around. Um, it's not core to our business. Um, and so making those optimizations uh, are, uh, are important, but you have to take the right and appropriate measured steps to protect and ensure the compliance and regulatory uh, security of that data that you're moving to this type of service. And so, you know, I, I think that just regular business users uh, deleting things in my experience have, have caused me some of the biggest heartaches uh, in my career in IT. Um, and I do think that, uh, uh, you know, ev everybody's concerned about hackers and, and for sure they can do the most destruction. Um, but uh, sometimes it can be as simple as somebody deleting something and forgetting they did it. And then, you know, um, you have a uh, seven days or something like that uh, uh, and kind of an active and then a little bit of a recycle bin as well in Office 365. and uh, I think, uh, Michael, right, 30, 30 days, right, Mike? Um, that data's days. gone, right? Yeah. So it's gone forever. Uh, and if your user didn't realize that they deleted it within 30 days, you're, you're pretty toast. Um, so it's something to consider. So, you know, as you look at some of the more nefarious sides of, uh, Office 65 data or any type of data, honestly, you know, this is more generic than that, but, um, you know, total cost of data breaches is a very hard thing to estimate, but Semantics made an approach at it. Um, and that's the, the kind of the reference data point here from Semantic is, you know, $3.92 million uh, in 2019 was the average total cost. And I mean, they're trying to get everything in this, uh, brand reputation damage, uh, breach notification, insurance, credit monitoring, um, loss of customers. They're, they're really trying to do this holistically. So uh, the number is, is definitely high, um, but I, I do think that it's probably pretty close, right? In terms of, uh, especially if you take some of the larger breaches that have occurred and larger organizations. Uh, I was just reading one this morning, uh, a ransomware of, a, of a, a prominent New York City law firm right here in the middle of COVID, you know, they got a $21 million demand 
decided not to pay it uh, and now have had all of their contracts and they do business with, you know, your, uh, your Lady Gaga's and your Lizzo's and your, you know, everybody, Madonna. And uh, they've had their public or their private contracts with these artists and different lawsuits that, have, that they've gone through have now been strewn across the internet. Um, and it's caused irreparable damage to this law firms uh, and, and their, uh, their clientele are, are probably going to be running for the hills as, as quickly as possible. So it's really important that even if you feel like you might not be a target, a lot of these people that are looking to kind of infiltrate accounts and take it, whether it's ransomware, whether it's a, a, a username password hacking in Office 365, they're not exactly being uh, uh, taking a spear approach uh, and and trying to target specific folks. A lot of times, they're just working through kind of vast lists of organizations trying to find anything of interest. And I think that that is where a lot of people get in trouble with this kind of mindset of oh, ah, you know, I'm just a I'm just a contractor. I don't really have anything super critical that anybody wants to take. Um, you know, it, it may feel that way internally, but when it happens and when it hits you, uh, it's not going to feel great. So um, I want to throw a couple one more out here from a poll perspective. You know, what size of data are, are you guys typically working with? Um, you know, try to focus, you know, on your Office 365 uh, subset for the, for the purposes of uh, this conversation. But I would imagine most of you guys are less than 100 TB of Office 365 data. Um, we do see quite a, a bit of folks uh, with very large OneDrive SharePoint installations. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, almost uh, almost on exact, uh, you know, 88% less than 100 TB. That's all you 88% of uh, sub 500 employees. Uh, and then 13% uh, of 100 to 500 TB. Um, you know, I think that that's, uh, or 12% of uh, somebody, some statistics are off on the uh, GoToMeeting uh side there, 12% 100 to 500 TB, that's, that's everybody else. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty sizable. I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, um, you know, you'd be shocked at how many critical things can exist in 50 terabytes of text for the most part, right? Documents and drawings and, you know, all these things. Uh, it, it's, um, it's something to, to, to consider. And then what does that look like for you, right? If you're looking at like ransomware or even if you're looking at like Office 365, let me let me take this one back, you know, ransomware or uh, um, fighting, uh, you know, kind of nefarious actors with some type of Microsoft security tool. Do you feel like you're leveraging, you know, E5 uh, subscription and all of its capabilities from security perspective to get every last little bit of data security that you can. Okay. Give this one a second because I forgot to hit the press the poll button. Um, all right. You know, I think that most of you are looking at this and saying, okay, there, yeah, I'm, I've done something. I hope it's enough. I'm interested in trying to see what else is out there, but, you know, uh, you know, I, I definitely feel like uh, we could be doing something more. And I think that that's, um, that's where I would expect most people to kind of land on these things. So that's solid. All right. And with that, I'm going to throw it over to Michael. Let him talk a little bit about uh, what Veeam's developed around uh, Office 365 and protecting that data. Um, he's going to little, talk a little bit about the architecture. And then we're going to jump right into a live demo. Um, the demo you're going to see is uh, effectively Veeam's product and solution. Uh, and uh, in this context, uh, from a service provider perspective, we're taking care of this stuff for you. But as he gets into uh, the data exploration capabilities and being able to look at it and those end user activities, I think you're going to see some really exciting things uh, that are going to make this product uh, pretty awesome. So uh, take it away, Michael. Thank you, William, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Michael Deemer. I'm the systems engineer here for Veeam. Uh, and yeah, today we'll be going over the O365 piece and kind of showing you out the Veeam side of the business. So um, so basically, what is Veeam? Like, what does it look like for us? And what does it look like for you guys? So a little bit about it. So so the what we're doing is we're protecting your Office, 360, Office 365 data from accidental deletion, security threats, 
and retention policy gaps. Because as we spoke a little bit about earlier, recently, William, uh, the retention policy for office is about 30 days. And that's really the most you're going to get out of it. You can push it a little bit longer, but realistically, you're really pushing the threshold if, if you're going to even get your data back. Now, also what we do leverage is quick individual restores of individual files. So we can go all the way down to the granular level, so file level, going down to, um, you know, just in a piece of the exchange email, Teams chat, uh, SharePoint or OneDrive. And then also making it legal and compliant for keeping your data for long term. So I'm going to show you out our retention policy and what it looks like for Veeam, but you're going to see how much more vast and how much longer that we can keep the data for you uh, once you switch over to the Veeam side of the house. Um, if you could for me, William, just one more slide, please, before we pass it over. Perfect. So this is going to be the architecture, right? So let's just kind of look at it from a very high overview. Um, what do we protect? We protect Exchange, we protect SharePoint, which protect OneDrive for business. Now, in that as well, we do protect Teams. It's just not in there. All these are basically, so OneDrive for business is SharePoint with a fancy skin over it. Then we got SharePoint. Uh, and then Teams is technically SharePoint, again, with another fancy skin over it. And then Exchange. So then we have the Veeam backup uh, for Office 365 server, uh, which would be on-prem with, with Phoenix App. And then what do we have? Or what can we also back up on-premise? So we can back up on-prem Exchange servers and then also on-prem SharePoint servers. Now, where can we go with this data? So we can go really any place that you want to go. We can go directly to the object here, such as, you know, Phoenix map landing on them, or we can even land back on local. So it really depends what you guys are looking to do, but we can do either there. And then we have multiple different recovery options. So these are going to be the explorers that I'm going to show you out here in in the in the demo today. And actually, William, if you could just pass me over the ball, that way I can get the demo up and running, and we'll get that started. Let's do this. Boom. Let's make sure it's sharing this. All right, William. Just to verify, are you able to see my screen? Yep, we're good, Mike. Perfect, perfect. So the very first thing I wanna talk about is the pretty user interface. So the pretty user interface is gonna come with two different ISOs once you actually download it. So they're gonna be the one that you see here. Uh, and then you also have another one for PowerShell. If you're more PowerShell privy, you can go with that one. But I would say uh, the majority of clients and tenants and partners tend to go this route uh, for this particular reason because it's user friendly. So I'm gonna kind of talk high overview of the architecture components because this is all gonna be handled through Phoenix Map anyway. So you're not really gonna to have to do any of this. Uh, but I just kind of want to let you in on kind of the background information so you kind of know all the moving pieces and how everything works. Um, so the very first thing I wanna talk about is the proxy. So when you hear Veeam and you hear proxies, think of the muscle. So this is gonna be doing the, the dedupe, the compression and the encryption on the fly, but more importantly, Think of proxies as the muscle. So this is actually moving the, the, the data or the data sets from, let's just say you're 0365. So if you're in 0365, that means you're in Azure. Uh, so if you're moving those data sets from an Azure data center back down to Phoenix Map, or you're moving them back down to on-prem, this is gonna be the guy that's actually traversing the WAN and pushing that data down. Now, the next biggest thing is gonna be the repository. So the repositories is where we're gonna actually land that data. So a repository is very, very easy to configure. You're just gonna go click add repository. But since we already have a couple configured here, I'll kind of just show you how, how it looks. Uh, you're gonna give it a name, give it a description, and then you, and this again, this is all gonna be done on the Phoenix Snap side, so you're not really gonna have to worry about it. But again, you're gonna choose the proxy and then choose the path that it's gonna live on. Now, this is if you wanted to basically go to the object here. So that object here being like a Phoenix Snap, for instance. Um, highly suggest that we use encryption over it. So we use AES 256 bit. So when it traverses the WAN, it's gonna be all safe and protected against all those threats. And then the next biggest piece I really wanna drill in here is the retention period. So our minimum, not, I guess I wouldn't say minimum because this is our, our, I guess our standard. So one year to 25 years or keep forever. Now, if you wanna have a retention policy less than one year, you just do specified numbers, a specified number of days. However, I, I would assume most people want to keep their, da their, their data for at least a year. So that's why our 
technically not our minimum, but that's what we're going to be our first option is one year. Now, now there is two different types of retention policies, item level retention and snapshot based retention. Uh, snapshot based retention basically takes a snapshot of the entire database. And when I mean the entire database, I truly mean the entire database. So SharePoint, OneDrive, uh, Exchange, and Teams. Um, and then moving on here from the architecture, right? So this is going to be the backup infrastructure. Again, this is all being handled from Phoenix app. So this is going to be your proxy, again, so your data mover and where that data is landing. And the next biggest architecture piece is adding in the, or the organization. So it's very, very simple. Uh, I'm going to kind of show you that, that here today. So you're basically just picking your deployment type. So if you're full 365, uh, you're just going to go, okay, cool. I'm all 365. I'll pick this. Now, if you're hybrid, so if you're hybrid, that means you have, you know, maybe a SharePoint on-prem or an exchange on-prem. Basically, you just think of these down here as the services that you're wanting to back up. So from here, after you pick out your organization type, uh, most of you probably are in the O365, or if you guys are in the hybrid uh, environment, you can do that as well. Now, we also have an on-prem if you're fully on-prem. So exchange on-prem, SharePoint on-prem. We can definitely protect you as well there. But really, the next biggest thing I want to talk about is authenticating. So there's basic authentication and then modern authentication. So we're talking about security here, right? So the biggest thing for security is modern authentication, MFA. So what do we need to actually connect to the tenant? Application ID, application certificate, and application uh, secret. Now, those also come with username and password, granting roles and permissions to SharePoint and OneDrive. Again, all this is on the back end, which is going to be handled by Phoenix now. Now, what I really want to show you here is this going to be the next two pieces of the puzzle. So that's going to be all the architecture, right? So the architecture is already done. It's very, very easy. Uh, it's very, very straightforward. Uh, the next biggest thing here is going to be a backup job. So going in here and actually creating a backup job. So we're going to give it a name, give it a description. And the next piece here is actually how we start to get really granular. So we can have one backup job that does the, the entire organization. And when I truly mean the entire organization, I truly mean it. So it's going to be SharePoint, OneDrive, Exchange, and Teams. All those data sets are going to be collected and then basically added in as a VMDK. So your very first uh, backup is going to be a VMDK. And then after that, it's going to be forward incremental. So you're just going to be catching the metadata or the change rate data going forward. Um, so most people have one job that does the entire organization. And then they have maybe some secondary jobs for maybe some C-level employees or maybe some other users, groups, sites, organizations. Now, for this particular one, I'm going to kind of show you out the user side. Um, so this is, let's just say you have, let's just say, some C-level employees that you want to have, you know, oh, maybe a different job or maybe a different section of job uh, for them. So we'll just click a couple people in here and we'll add them in. Now, this is where we can, again, get granular. So this job is going to back up the entire organization. And this is actually getting granular. So let's just say for Mr. Worm here, we're like, hey, he only does a lot of shared mailboxes. So he manages a whole bunch of shared mailboxes. So we really don't care about his archive, his OneDrive, or his site. However, Jamie, on the other hand, does. She does a whole bunch of stuff with OneDrive and sites. Not so much her archive and not so much her mail. And then John here. So he only really does our, uh, OneDrive. So he does a lot of different stuff on OneDrive. And let's just say he does a lot of stuff on SharePoint. And then for uh, Tarla here, she just does a little bit of everything. Now, all this would still be backed up inside the, the organization tab, but this is just making it easier if you have a subset of users that you want to have maybe some little more special attention to. Now, this is going to be the objects that you want to exclude. So this would be any of the service accounts, anything that basically inside of your tenant or inside of that environment that you just didn't want to have backed up, this is where we're going to put that in. Now, this is going to be choosing your proxy. So if you have multiple proxies in your environment, you can choose what proxy it's going to find. And then actually choosing the backup repository, so where that data is going to land. And then last but definitely not least is how often this job is going to run. So we're going to have this job kicked off at 9 p.m. every day. Now, if you had it certain days of the week, you can definitely do that. Or if you really, really want to make it granular, you can. So you can actually have this job kicked off every five minutes to every eight hours, just depending on how granular you want to get here. Now, the next biggest piece here is going to be the retry object. So 
what it's going to do is going to try three different times with 10 minutes in between. And on that third attempt, what it's going to do is actually sever the job if there's an error and then send you a report via SMTP to your mail server. And that way you get, that's way you see what's going on inside the environment. Go in and check it and see what's going on. Now, this is called the Explorer. So the Explorer is going to be how you actually get that data back, restore it back onto prem or back into the object here, wherever you want to put it. So there's really two different ways. So there's a point in time state, and then there's this state, which I'm going to show you that I like a little bit more. Or actually, let me back up. That's not the one I wanted to click. Go back. So we're going to do the point in time state, just because I feel like you get a little more bells and, uh, bells and features with this. Uh, so one, you get to specify the time, the time, the date, what you want to roll back to. So let's roll back to yesterday there. And then we have some e-discovery settings. So these e-discovery settings are huge. Um, instead of going into the O365 tenant and running them that way, and then sometimes waiting 24 to 48 hours for them to query the databases, and then getting an email saying, hey, uh, you, you finally have it. And then you go in and check, and you're off by one day, and then you got to wait another 24 to 48 hours for that e-discovery report to run. So this is definitely going to help. So this is going to show the items that have been deleted and modified by the user. We'll finish and let the, this is mounting the entire um, exchange server here. So this is going to be your entire tenant. Now that little block that you just seen pop up is actually just saying right now what you're, what you're browsing is metadata. Uh, so the metadata portion is basically saying, hey, we're going to browse local storage. That way you don't have to go into the object here and, you know, um, basically remount the entire server in the object here. Now from the very top, what can we do? So if we needed to, we can remount the entire um, O365 server. So this is going to be the this is going to be the entire server. So we can also pull this on to prem. So we can pull this to the desktop or pull it as a PST file. So this is where we can really start to get granular. So let's actually dig into a user here, so we can see his archive, his calendars, his contacts, and their conversation history is going to be all of his Teams chat data, and then deleted items. So anything that's been deleted. Um, and now this is all going to match a retention period. So let's just say you have a five-year retention period. You're going to see anything in here from five years. Um, and then going down into the inbox. So what most people are going to be wanting to see a little more often and what you're probably going to be restoring from is the inbox, right? Or maybe your outbox or something. But most likely it's going to be your inbox. So what kind of options do we have for actually getting that data back on print or back in the object here, right? So the biggest thing I really like is opening and previewing the piece of mail. So verifying that this is a piece of granular data that we're actually needing to pull back. So we can actually view it. Okay, this is the right one. And then if we need to restore it, we definitely can. So we can actually restore it back to the same user in his mailbox. So if we restore it, it's actually going to go back and just look like that piece of mail was never opened. But on the back end, on the SMTP server, uh, the MX records, all that stuff is going to basically stay the same. There's nothing on that, from that side that's going to change. Now, if you needed to restore it to multiple different users, you definitely can. Now, we have the options to export. So we can export to the desktop, export to a PST file, ex and then you have a couple saving options. So save to the desktop and save as a message file. Now, this is where there's two different. So we can restore it or we can send it. So if we send it back to the user, it's going to look like a brand new piece of, piece of mail just came into their inbox. Restoring it would actually put it back in chronological order. So there is a little bit of a difference there. Uh, so this is putting it back in chronological order. And this is basically put in as a new piece of email. Now, let's just say this, this mailbox is a shared mailbox, right? Um, and you now need to send it to two or three users at one time. Can you do that? Absolutely. You just press send to. You mark the users that you want to send it to, and it sends it to them. Now, the other biggest thing I like to talk about is advanced find. So advanced find is, let's just say, you're, you're not really finding a piece of, uh, of email or SharePoint, OneDrive, um, that you, know, you just couldn't find it in your email box. So you come in here to a self-service portal, and you go, okay, well, I just need to look at it and see what's going on. So you can actually put in here like X, Y, and Z, um, and then it's going to search by the entire exchange and see what it can find in there. Now, you can also compare with production. You can save items, export, and restore them here right from the top. Um, that's going to be the exchange portion. And then I'm also going to show you out the OneDrive and SharePoint. 
So the OneDrive piece, actually, let's do SharePoint next. So we'll do the point in time state again. So again, so we're going to be able to pick that point in time that we want to restore from and then show the, show the e-discovery settings. So what's been deleted and what has been modified by the user. We'll let this finish and let this mount the server here. All right, so this was the error that I was talking about error. It's not really truly an error. It's just saying, hey, right now you're browsing metadata. And if you are going to restore, you could possibly could occur some charges. So we're just kind of making you aware of what's going on. So right here from the very top. So SharePoint and OneDrive for the Explorer side are going to be almost identical because at the end of the day, they're going to have the same API calls that they're going to have in SharePoint that they're going to have in OneDrive. So what can we do? So we still have that advanced find feature that I was talking to uh, just in the Explorer or in the Exchange side, but we also can come down here and let's just pick some sub sites. Let's do this, some of this content here. So we can actually start drilling into some of this, doc this documentation. So let's actually look at this database. Actually, I don't like that database. Let's look. There we go. Set mm, pages. I like pages better. All right. So what can we do here? So we can open and preview it just like you could in Exchange. You can also view the history. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the history on this one, but I will show you the view and the properties because I think it's it's almost uh, realistically really really the same. Um, and then we can restore the document. So if you need to restore the document for whatever reason, you can do that right from here. If you need to save the file or save it to a zip, you can do it. And then sending the document out. So if you just need to attach it to an email, uh, so on and so forth, this is where you're going to be able to do it. But what I really like is viewing the property. So from an admin level, this really helps alleviate a lot of pain because you're going to see, okay, who it does it have inherited permission? When was the last time it was modified? What version are we on? Are we on the 1.0, 3.1? You know, where out, where out, where are we in that, you know, in that time frame? You know, the source. So how, what, what size is the, the actual file here? And where does it actually come into the item? Is it in the child or is it in the parent folder? You know, and then who actually has it checked out? So right now, Jon Snow has it checked out. And you can go in here and start getting really granular to see what actually applies for what you're trying to look for. And let me tell you, this versioning will save a lot of admins a lot of time because you can go in and say, hey, I just need to revert to the 2.0 version. Uh, it looks like we're on 3.0 and there's been, you know, maybe some corruption or something that's got deleted or somebody has it checked out and they didn't check it back in uh, and they made a whole bunch of changes that they shouldn't have. So we can just roll back to versioning. So that's going to be huge. All right. And then the last, definitely but not least, is going to be this, the uh, OneDrive piece. So again, we're going to do the point in time state, uh, show the e-discovery settings, and we'll let that finish. Now, right now, what it's doing is, okay, so again, this is just saying we're browsing the metadata, and then we'll let this come in here. So what can we get right here from, from OneDrive, right? So we're going to have all the same options. So we can save uh, or advance find, save the files, restore the files, and then actually come in, in here and looking at the data. So actually, let's look at Mr. Gray here. So let's look at from the very top. So again, we can open and preview that data, making sure that we have the piece of granular data set that we need to pull it back on prem. We can view the history of that data. We can restore the data so we can keep it or override it, just depending on what's going on inside the environment and what's needed at that time. Copy in. So if you just need to copy the document, save it as a file or save it as a zip. Obviously, you want to save it as a zip if you have a lot of different files that you want to do, less I.O., less compression, so on and so forth. And then sending the document. So if you just need to send the document to wherever your heart desires, this is going to, what's going to help you to do that. And then, again, viewing the properties. So, again, this is going to be huge for helping uh, especially the even you, the end user, could help just seeing where we're at inside of, uh, you know, the the account here. So the biggest thing to take away is the versioning. When was it modified? Uh, is it checked in, checked out? Uh, is there any retention or in the sensitive, sensitivity of it? Uh, and then who created it? Um, that's really going to be the O365 piece in a nutshell. There's definitely a lot more to it, but this is kind of more of a high overview of it. Uh, and I'm going to pass this back over to William, uh, one of our Platinum DCSP partners. And, uh, yeah, he'll be able to take it over from here. All right. Thank you so much, Michael, for that rundown. I hope everyone loved 
the live demo interaction. I think it's great to see kind of how this works. Um, you know, as I look at, you know, the, you know, the offerings that we have and the strength of the capabilities that we have around uh, not only Veeam or uh, Office 365 uh, and backing up and archiving that data and keeping it secure, but also a myriad of Veeam technologies, you know, it's important to kind of look at the type of provider uh, that uh, is is producing these services. Uh, Veeam has done a great job of partnering with a lot of folks. Um, not everyone created equal in terms of the performance, the types of infrastructure and options that they offer. Um, we have so many different ways to interact with these capabilities, right? So uh, Michael talked about using uh, S3, compatible object storage. Um, you can leverage us just for that. You don't need to do a fully managed backup for Office 365 environment. If you want to go buy uh, Veeam's uh, uh, software from them or from your reseller, leverage it on-prem, and then archive directly to our object storage uh, service, you can do that. If you want to go consume a uh, kind of all-you-can-eat pay per user, which is kind of how we, we uh, price uh, and provide uh, our fully managed service, you can just pay uh, a number of dollars, low number of dollars per user, um, same as your Microsoft Office 365 bill uh, as an add-on, and then uh, get uh, uh, um, uh, archiving of uh, email, OneDrive, and SharePoint data um, today, as well as Teams, as, as Michael had had mentioned. Um, I think it's it's important to kind of look at uh, the two options distinctly, right? One is, look, have you made the decision to go uh, kind of all into the cloud, um, or are you looking for uh, ways just to to still consume solutions yourself, manage everything yourself, um, working with uh, both? Uh, is uh, is uh, well, having the different modalities is kind of core to our um, our service delivery model. As I mentioned, you know, for larger accounts, it can be as little as two dollars per mailbox per month, uh, and even for really small accounts, it doesn't get much more than that, right? It's very kind of low dollars per user per month type service, um, and it really does complete that three to one story, right? You can truly get that off cloud copy of the data. Uh, which it, I believe uh, is essential. And you still are in control, right? You can still leverage the Veeam Explorer that Michael was showing. You can still go look at all your data, download it, export it to PST, uh, export files. You can do all of that from various versions and different restore points. You're completely in control of your data, um, even if that, uh, that archive is uh, backed up on our object storage service or backed up by us as part of a managed offering. So I think there's a kind of a lot to consume there. We did have a one question, kind of a specifically uh, uh, pertains to uh, uh, integration. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, when you look at S3, there's a lot of different uh, capabilities that are there, both as a, a, a comp S3 compatible object storage uh, service like we offer, uh, or Amazon S3 itself, and someone asked a little bit about going all the way to like Glacier Deep Archive. Um, there are extreme performance challenges with that. Um, it is unfortunately not supported today. Um, if you leverage Veeam's products, any of them, and the cloud ca capabilities, I believe, Michael, it's just S3 standard and infrequent access, correct? Yep, correct. Um, so um, that's unfortunately not possible. Okay, so. I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump through. It's important to understand that it doesn't stop here, right? Data protection, uh, long-term archival um, can be essential to securing your business. Office 365 is where we spent the majority of our time today, um, but it's important to kind of let everybody know that we have a myriad of solutions, core to Beam, right, um, where we either uh, provide an infrastructure service, provide a managed uh, data protection service, or even provide a holistic uh, secure cloud service where we are doing backups and data security and uh, network security for you um, and your business. So there's a lot of different ways to consume this. Uh, it's available in a ton of locations worldwide. Um, I think we're offering this the full portfolio in six locations that are on this map today. 
um, and we're looking to expand that as well as uh, new locations. In fact, uh, we just launched Helsinki, um, or um, we're just about to launch Helsinki here. So um, there's a there's a lot of different regionality and capabilities that we're bringing to the forefront. Um, and then I'm gonna ask one last poll question as I jump into some questions that were uh, that were brought up here. And uh, we're gonna do the, uh, hey, you wanna get in touch with us? Let us know and we will reach out to you after this um, and kind of talk through some of the different solutions that we offer. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna jump into some questions. Um, you know, somebody said, why would I pay for a subscription for this when I can buy a QNAP or Synology NAS and back up Office 365? Um, yeah, so I think that ultimately, um, if you look at the, uh, the capabilities that Beam provides around uh, data protection and data verification, they are far superior than just taking a OneDrive client or something like that and just pulling down files and syncing them somewhere or using uh, um, uh, uh, a kind of off the shelf uh, uh, software that doesn't have a pedigree in data protection to uh, to keep that data secure and under control. Um, are there cheaper ways to do this than buying Beam and pu putting storage in yourself or leveraging our uh, managed service? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's true uh, with a lot of things, right? I mean, there's a lot of cheaper ways to do things, um, but do they provide the level of protection that your that your business needs? That's the question you have to ask yourself at the end of the day, right? Are you getting adequate protection? And, and if you are, by all means, please do whatever is most cost effective for your organization. We're in a time of extremely constrained budgets. And if you don't feel like what either Veeam or us or any of our com mutual competitors are offering is valuable and you feel like you have a different way to do it, um, I uh, would say that, uh, you know, do your due diligence, make sure you're getting what you need for your business, but past that, if that works for you, um, you know, please, by all means. Um, we had another one. Um, <laughs> oh man. So uh, um, I won't give last names, but Rich, thank you for bringing this up because uh, we're dealing with a, an interesting uh, customer right now. Uh, the, the question was, we want to reduce our SharePoint uh, storage costs and not go over the free quota. Uh, does this provide a, a full archive solution? And any, yeah, so I can have any data not touched for more than two years, move your service and delete it from, uh, from SharePoint. The answer is absolutely unequivocally yes. However, um, you have to have a well laid out SharePoint environment. We're dealing with a customer right now um, and we're, we're working so hard with Veeam to try to get this uh, done. They, they just shoved 50 terabytes of SharePoint data uh, into uh, basically two SharePoint sites uh, on SharePoint Online. And Microsoft's APIs uh, severely restrict the transfer rate per site per account um, and getting that much data out of SharePoint online um, by a specific deadline um, can be extremely challenging. So Rich, please reach out, you know, let's have that conversation and talk about kind of what that looks like for you. But absolutely, if, if we took a copy of that data, shoved it in uh, a, an archive, you're going to be paying a fraction of what it would cost to keep it around in SharePoint Online. I think the customer we're working with was quoted 70,000 a year for, I don't know if the Delta was 40 terabytes or if they were leveraging 40 terabytes and that was a, some type of you know uh, difference between their included amount. I think the, the included amount with their subscription was in the 20 or 25 area. Um, but it was 70,000 extra a year just to have that 20 or 40 terabytes, either one, pick your number. Uh, crazy dollars to store that much data. Um, so yes, there absolutely can be uh, some optimizations made there. Um, and then we did mention uh, that $2 price point. Uh, it absolutely does. So if you have a thousand users and you uh, have SharePoint, OneDrive, everybody for that thousand users, $2 to, to $3 a month for that thousand users is gonna be in your price range. Um, and that's uh, that's going to include all that OneDrive data, the SharePoint data, and the email data, um, as well as you know 
sorry, Michael, but you, you don't have to go buy the Beam software or buy local storage, right? You get the kind of everything uh, managed uh, together there for you. So um, we, we do it on a per user basis. That can be great for some organizations. That can be crazy for some organizations. Uh, there are reasons for that. It's the, the, it's the way that we've modeled our, our cost structures. But for the majority of organizations, we feel like that really does work well, right? To just know, okay, you know, I have a thousand users. I'm going to pay two to three dollars more per user, and uh, now I've got my uh, office. You know, pretty much the majority of my Office 365 data. There are some parts of Office 365 that are not uh, in scope today, uh, but the the critical, typically critical parts of it are going to be backed up, archived, and secured. Um, I think that that's a, a, a solid value there. Um, and uh, today, uh, Rich, it is including unlimited data. So, um, you know, uh, I think that for us, we've seen some pretty large accounts, but for the majority, most, you know, most folks have, uh, you know, 250 to 500 gigs of data per user. It's probably a, a solid number, if not less. Um, so I think that that's a, a good one. Any other questions from anybody in the audience that wants to get something off the chest? All right. I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their day. I want to thank Michael so much for uh, joining me and uh, and giving us a demo today. Thank you, Michael. Everybody clap. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, William. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and, I hear all and, the uh, clap. <laughs> yeah, there's, they're everywhere, dude. It's a resounding chorus of, of, uh, of clapping. Um, and... Uh, and uh, with that, I hope everyone stays safe uh, and joins us for our next webinar. Uh, shouldn't be long. That's all we got to do these days is webinar. So please come listen to us talk about something new and inventive uh, next time. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, everyone.